the imaginary asexuality of Buddhism and the Greek influence. What happened next? Next was Buddhism. And Buddhism has actually laid down some new perspective on desire in the Indian traditions. As you remember, Buddha proclaimed four noble truths. And the first noble truth formulated that dukkham jivam, i.e. life is suffering, birth is suffering, and death is suffering. Not achieving the desire to suffering and loss. Termination of the desire to suffering. And as an explanation of why life is suffering, Buddha introduced the second noble truth. From his point of view, the source of all suffering is, well, in the Russian translation, most often translated as desire. This is not entirely accurate, to be honest. Because in the Dharma Chakra Pravatna Sutra, the word used is not Kama, desire, but Trishna, thirst. In fact, Trishna is rather a strong desire, it is a fixation. But partly with some kind of stretch, it can be said that Buddha declared the desire to be the main enemy of man. Moreover, one of the main plots, strictly speaking, of the life path of Buddha is the battle of Buddha with the demon Mara. When Buddha had already practically reached the enlightenment, or he even reached it, but maybe he still didn't quite understand what he had reached, at that moment Mara with all his hordes appeared to him. Here on the bottom of the picture are just depicted the hordes of Mara, as they were seen in the art of Gandhara. And these hordes initially were seducing Buddha in the form of beautiful women, daughters of Mara, as was written in the corresponding sutra. And then in the image of Mara's troops, who were approaching and trying to frighten Buddha. But Buddha understood the illusory nature of both, and thus he defeated the demon Mara, and even defeated the last temptation of the demon Mara, a doubt. What does this have to do with us? The fact is that the name Mara itself was already by this time in the Indian tradition. Mara is death. But on the other hand, Mara is one of the names of Kama. Love is a little death. And it turns out that by defeating Mara, Buddha defeated Kama. And accordingly, the image of Kama as something negative, as something connected with the demonic world, as something that tempts something that takes a person out of the state of inner peace, began to firmly consolidate itself in Buddhism. Moreover, although you see, Buddha himself said in his first sermon that Trishna is the source of suffering, such a thirst, but when in later Buddhism a model of three poisons were, was developed, or three kleshas, three sources of being, these sources were called Kama, Kroda, and Avidya. Kama is symbolized in the image. Here it is depicted as a parrot, usually in the form of a cock. Although we understand what the parrot is, it is a vakana, Kama's riding animal. Krota in the form of a snake, hatred, anger, and avidya, unwillingness to disassociate with proper forms of behavior, thoughts with yourself, in the form of a pig. So in Buddhism, the desire began inch by inch to begin become stigmatized. Here is a second step of the breakaway of Indian culture from some deep sensuality. But I must say that not everything was so sad, because although Buddhism seems to have begun in some way to stigmatize the concept of the desire, but Buddhist art itself was not at all like that. Again, this year, having traveled around Pakistan, a significant portion of the journey was devoted to the art of Greek Buddhism, i.e. the art of Gandhara, of the area where Buddhism itself has in many ways gained strength. On the other hand, he came into contact with the newcoming troops of Alexander the Macedonian and his descendants, and accordingly saturated with images of Greek culture, etc. And here are wonderful examples of Gandhara art. As you see, these are erotic scenes. In one scene, the man tries to give the woman a wreath. In the other, on the contrary, the woman holds out a wreath to the man, and the lungi is already almost shed from her. 
In almost all traditions of the world, the image of a wreath corresponds to the image of sexual desire. This archetype is still from ancient Egypt, but it was also present in India. As a matter of fact, why girls are making wreaths even now, maybe. Not everyone understands this, but of course, this is the image again, purely sexual. And in this case, see the picture is saturated with double connotation. On the one hand, there is an act of courtship, but on the other hand, it is even clear who seduces whom, who actually wanted, who has this very present desire. Remember, then in the art of Kajirahu, there appears another image of sexual desire, when a girl stands and a scorpion crawls along her leg. Why? Because it's a symbol of the approaching desire, just as goosebumps go through the body and approach the area of the Svadhisthana. So desire slowly comes from the feet. But here the image is different. We see who, strictly speaking, is experiencing now, who has Svadhisthana energy, and who wants to seduce another person. And pay attention, in the second picture you can clearly see how the girl, why is she not seduced? Because she looks in a mirror, she thinks, is it worthy of my royal honor? Am I like that or not? And anyway, do I look good? And will my hairstyle become rumpled? This art is an erotic art, as it had not direct relationship to Buddhism. Let's see one of these stele, which were extracted from the construction of a stupa, these are the scenes concerning the life of Buddha in the palace before he, as a matter of fact, went into asceticism and decided to become Buddha. Note how rich the scenes are, although if we look at them closely, we will realize that they are in fact very similar to the images of Greek symposiums. People who are half lying, half sitting at tables, raising bowls, around there are some courtesans around, unbridled joy, etc. And in general, we can say that these are images that were located in religious buildings, and we're not confusing anyone. I would say that this culture has not lost sensual potential yet. Or, here's an image. Note there is such a semi-naked woman with pronounced forms, from whom the clothes covering her are about to fall off. But this is an image of Maya, the mother of Buddha. But how sensual it is, how subtle it is, how erotic it is. So despite the fact that Buddhism itself initially promoted the idea, let's say about the need to fight and eradicate the desire. In fact, Buddhism itself and the corresponding culture were full of potential. Maybe because Buddhism existed in Gandhara and in general thought this Bactrian culture and later as this dynasty was transformed, I will not bother you now about it, but Buddhism existed along with other religions. We also visited one such Greek Indian city, in fact, the ruins that are somewhat reminiscent of the ruins in Pompeii. And it was very interesting to see that here the Zoroastrian temple stands next to a Buddhist stupa, next to the Jain temple and some Apollo temple. The rest are not preserved there, but it is clear that they were here other temples of other gods, just through the wall. Of course, with such a feeling of the diversity of the gods, the diversity of the ways, the diversity of possibilities, say it is difficult for one religion to somehow predominate and impose someone to ascetic perception. And the city is 2,000 years old. It existed from the second millennium BC to the fifth century of our era. By the way, it is interesting that in the same art of Gandhara, there are a lot of Greek paintings, Greek images, in particular, the magnificent image on the right side, quite recognizable as Cupid in Psyche. Note that he has small wings, but Cupid and Psyche are partly Greek and partly something Indian is already felt in this image. The plot of Cupid and Psyche, perhaps you remember, there was a beautiful girl, Psyche, in which Cupid, the god of love, fell in love with himself. But he wanted to act undercover, and therefore they agreed that they would meet at night. She would never see him. I, she didn't know who he was. But one night, she decided all the same, frightened by her sisters, to shine a lamp. She admired him. The hand twitched, the oil was spilled on him. He woke up, said, what have you done, and flew away. Then she searched for him for 30 years. But, in general, everything ended well. And on the other hand, again, what? We see what? Fully recognizable Greek symposium. 
So what am I talking about? And this is all Buddhist art. Why am I saying this? To the fact that although Buddhism denied desire formally, in reality this denial has not yet entered into Indian cultural space. This is also a very interesting deity, which already expresses more likely, probably not sensual, but some other desire. This is the goddess of Triti, the goddess who actually came to this zone together with the Greeks, and she corresponds to the Roman and Greek goddess Teach. the goddess of the home, comfort, good luck, and all this kind of things. But in the Buddhist tradition, her image was re represented as follows. From the point of view of Buddhists, she was a Rakshasi. A Rakshasi is a mythological being in Hindu mythology. As this mythology influenced other religions, the Rakshasa was later incorporated into Buddhism, who had a hundred children whom she loved very much. And she loved them so much that she was catching other children from nearby villages and fed them to her children to keep them well fed. And Buddha realized that it was not good, and stole one child from this Rakshasi, hid under his rice ball, and she could not find him. She felt very sad about this. And she came to Buddha. He said to her, you see how people who have kidnapped children suffer? She recovered her sight, understood everything, enlightened, and became the goddess patroness of childbirth, motherhood, etc. This story is about how the goddess from the Greek pantheon has penetrated the Buddhist pantheon. But the trick is that in the Buddhist pantheon she continued to exist. The image of Tara, which we already know well in the Tibetan tradition, appeared. And it has been proven for certain that from this image, the image of Japanese Bodhisattva Kanon, the most worshipful image in Japanese Buddhism, emerged. So it is very interesting that Japanese Buddhists, without knowing it, worshipped the Greek goddess who, through Ganhara, through Tibet, etc., neatly in fact reached Japan. But we are interested in it in another context. Please note that the very idea of the significance of motherhood, the importance of the desire, some of its forms, exists in it. Also note that there is some kind of Indianness, Indian solidity, Indian ripe forms in it, but also there are the Greek shaitan, a completely recognizable Greek hairstyle, some kind of Greek sensuality in this goddess, i.e. the image of motherhood as a meaningful desire, which in principle has its own deity, which was approved by Buddha himself, is contrary to the original idea. You see some healthy tendencies still begin to grow through, and the acceptance of desire again returned to this tradition.